Street. Peter Rutledge is the Superintendent of Financial Institutions. Thanks for being with us, Peter. Thanks, Amanda. Great to be here. So uh, one, it was interesting to get uh, to hear from you and a deputy from the bank on the same day and kind of a check-in on stability. Uh, this is obviously a hugely important part of our overall economy. So even people not in the market have to concern themselves with the health of the uh, the housing market. In terms of consumer credit, what's on your mind? What's, what's the health of that market right now? Yeah, well, what we're seeing, it's, it's very interesting. You mentioned 10% year-over-year uh, -year growth in residential mortgage credit. That's really fast by historic standards, and you, you referenced the 2008 date I, I cited last night in, our, in my speech. Um, that Paradoxically, uh, debt service is still quite uh, in, in line with what we've seen. Uh, it's high, but it's, it's not as high as it's been. And so what that's telling us is people are layering on a lot of credit uh, because house prices are going up faster, but they can afford it now. And, of course, the risk is interest rates go up or you get an employment shock, and then it's harder to service those mortgages. Now, we do have buffers in place to protect against that to a certain extent, but it remains a real concern. And if you peel back the onion, well, why, why are house prices going up as rapidly as they have, 24 percent since the onset of the pandemic nationally? Uh, it comes down to a real imbalance between housing supply and housing demand. Housing demand is driven by household formations. They're running well north of 200,000 uh, a year. Uh, and housing supply is, is, is not keeping up. It's under 200,000 over the last several years. And we need to correct that imbalance to rebalance risk in residential mortgage credit. So let's just talk about that when, we, when you talk about that, the kind of supply-demand imbalance. Uh, we have heard of this for many years now, Peter, right? We know yep. supply is an issue and we want to see it improved. We do, though, have this warning from uh, the bank, but, but it, it echoes data we've seen from Terranet and elsewhere that investors are making up a larger share yep. than they typically would uh, in the housing market, which does skew the demand side of it. Does that change your thinking at all about what we're seeing here? It's not just household formation. No. It's also secondary buyers. Um, the secondary buyers, the investors, they're making an investment to, to, to generate a return. And, you know, that's free market economy, more power to them. <clears throat> that's a sign of that imbalance, though. They're, they're recognizing there is that imbalance. They're recognizing there is that forward price pressure. And so they're jumping in to, to profit from the run-up. That's the way markets work. If we correct the supply-demand imbalance, you'll start to see, in my judgment, that uh, zeal, that, that uh, froth, start to dissipate. And uh, I think houses will become, uh, or rather residential mortgage credit, will become less of a threat to our, our system. Part of the analysis, as I understand it, with the role that that, that investor can play, uh, and, and obviously, of course, that is a, a kind of a market mechanism at work there. It's how markets do tend to work. Uh, it is, however, uh, much more flexible money. So in the event of a, of a downturn or correction yeah. or change in circumstance, that's the part of the market that we think would be hottest, if you will, that'll, that'll leave the market yeah. the quickest, most easily. Uh, and that yeah. leaves us room for a big correction. Would you agree with that, that it makes this the housing market more vulnerable to a sudden sharp correction than if it were all owned by individuals who are actually dwelling there? The, there are risks. You're right. There are risks on either side. The preponderance of risk, the risk that I, I judge to be uh, more threatening, would be uh, the, the risk of a persistent mismatch between housing supply and housing demand. That will ultimately add risk to the system and ultimately uh, perhaps lead to a disruptive resolution of that mismatch. Um, if, you, if we go the other way, if we start to see supply come into line with demand, that's a less disruptive path to stability. In other words, It'll take a while for supply to catch up to uh, demand. It won't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. And that'll uh, investors, I presume, will see that coming. They're pretty in touch with the housing market. And you'll see a much more gradual withdrawal of, of that zeal or that froth in the market. The other way, which is it keeps going up until something breaks, uh, the disruptive unwind is, is more severe. So I'll choose the... Uh, Let's do something now. Let's bring supply into, into line with demand over time. That's the less disruptive smooth landing in my judgment. It is, of course, though, uh, as you know and market participants know, not a new concept. It's one we've been talking about now um, with some vigor, at least, for about five years. Longer than that in many ways, but at least five yeah. years the conversation has been housing prices are getting away from us because of the supply side, not the demand side. 
you would therefore expect, if the market is working perfectly, that the market would solve that problem and homes would be built and prices would come down. There's obviously a disincentive in there somewhere. There's some piece of this market that's yeah. disconnected. Where is it and how do we undo that? I mean, to be blunt and straight, it's not in my backyard. Um, the, the path to more housing or, or to more housing units, more household formation is more density in our, in our cities. Uh, you saw that in some of the research that Mr. Beaudry referenced in his speech yesterday. Um, uh, the, the cities that have the highest price pressures are also the cities that uh, are most in need of more densification in their housing markets. And at the local and municipal level, we do need more densification if we want to have uh, a more stable, resilient housing finance system. Now, the CMHC has begun with its national housing strategy, is doing a lot on supply. You've seen in the speech from the throne the federal government's commitment to doing much more on supply and helping local uh, municipalities uh, in, in densifying and bringing more supply in, into the market. And uh, it would be very helpful and prudent if, uh, if we, at the local level, started to see more densification in zoning laws uh, in major municipalities in Canada. And uh, we just recently heard from your uh, office had a loosening of the regulations on banks around their ability to uh, to use their capital for dividends and buybacks, a signal perhaps that, you know, you consider the stress of the pandemic in some ways moving behind yeah. us. Uh, those same banks, of course, are offering extremely low mortgage rates to yeah. investors and homeowners alike, uh, treating yeah. them all as one. Uh, is that correct, or would you like to see the banks actually differentiate between uh, the uh, – and I'm, I'm almost going into human psyche here, Peter, if you will. Uh, yeah. I'm much more willing to or, – or likely to prioritize my mortgage if it's the roof over my kids' heads uh, than if it's a secondary investment. Uh, yeah. So does that not make that mortgage less risky in some ways to the banks, and should they not treat it that way? Um, as part of our supervision, we do have uh, a supervision of banks, for example. We do have guidelines in place. One is called B20, technical word, but it's it's uh, it sets some guidelines, principles, and rules for underwriting residential mortgages, including investor-owned homes. And we do expect more scrutiny uh, at the local or at the at the bank level for investor-owned loans for precisely that reason. Uh, and we do supervise to those that guideline or rules and, and principles. Um, nevertheless, uh, you know, a good news story about Canada is millions of or hundreds of thousands of people of, of, of highly educated uh, folks from outside Canada want to come to Canada and build lives here. Uh, that means they need houses to, to live in, and that means they tend to buy houses at a fairly... Uh, uh, rapid clip after they arrive, uh, and that means our housing market is is always fairly robust. That's a good news story. If we can just bring supply in into line with with that demand, uh, I think we have not only a, a a great country with a lot of human capital coming in every year, adding to the system, but we also have housing that's available to people of of all ages and housing that they that folks need to to live good lives. All right, I want to come back full circle, Peter, to where we started, which was that 10% growth in, uh, in credit risk. We are, of course, having a lot of conversations about affordability, about inflation. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you concerned about the, stabi the overall stability, uh, given that the growth in that in credit that we're seeing? Well, so just to, to clarify, that's 10% growth in residential mortgage credit. Uh, overall household credit growth is a bit slower because Canadians have actually been paying down their uh, credit card loans right. uh, and their investor loans. So just, just to be uh, to clear on that. Um, at present, no, I, I don't see that. I, we use the word moderate and modest increase in residential mortgage credit risk by intent. 10% year-over-year credit growth over a number of years in Canada would start to ratchet up the, the risk intensity. But for now, we'd characterize it as modest or moderate. Um, and uh, if, if, if we start to see some balance through hopefully more supply coming into the market, and I think 2021 will be a good year for housing completions, uh, and maybe a little bit of uh, the froth, post-pandemic froth continues to run off, I think we'll be, uh, we'll be okay. I, I don't have, perceive any immediate financial stability issues emerging from that. But if this continues, if, if 
uh, demand continues to outrun supply and therefore drive uh, house price pressure, uh, financial the, the risk of financial instability will move up. Uh, we uh, we hope by talking about this now uh, that we're starting to lean into that and lean against that, and we'll start to see some more uh, common sense come into uh, the housing supply side of the equation.